So as we jump into this, this is part two. So last spring, uh, we talked a little bit about like, hey, what kind of tones do we use for worship guitar? Because you know, there's multiple genres of music that have guitar in them. And so we unpacked some of the basics of like a modern worship guitar tone for electric guitar. And so today we're gonna talk about, hey, how do we use the Helix to achieve those kinds of sound? Um, so we're gonna spend some time learning kind of like how it works. And then we're gonna get hands on about, hey, if you have this tool and you have a guitar player who's coming in, how do you dial it in for them specifically? And then how can you also learn some tips to make that a little quicker, right? So today isn't gonna be every single detail there is to learn about the Helix. Um, you know, I thought about like, do I just share all the things that I've learned? And I don't think you need to know all of those things. You need to know a couple pathways to get you from a good guitar tone to a great guitar tone. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Any questions? Cool. And I'm gonna keep rolling through my list here, but if you have a question, like just be like, hey Cameron, you don't make any sense. Help me understand that. So in the first training we had physical guitar amps set up. We had individual stomp box pedals that were all wired together. And this is to that gear, what I would say a Kindle is to a, a library full of books. So this is a way that we take all those physical separate things and we put them in a compact and digital um, little home for it, if that makes sense. So, and you guys know, um, I just gotta check my notes here so I explain this right, but like in the same way that the Hela the same way that a Kindle, you know, there's a process for getting the physical books scanned, especially if it's like an old book, there's a way they scan it into that so you can read it and you can understand it. There's a process that they do for this. And so one of the things that helps, I think, with that um, kind of illustration is to recognize that when you read on a Kindle, it is a little bit different than reading a physical book. Like when you fall asleep at night with your Kindle in your hand, it bonks you on the head in a different way than if you're reading a book, right? Um, and the same way that there are some people that are really particular about, hey, when I read a book, I can't, the experience on the Kindle just feels really different to me. There's some people that feel that about digital modeling for guitar as well. But for most of us, 98% of what we're shooting for can be accomplished with the digital tool. Um, and so here at LCBC, this is the one you're gonna see the most. This is the Line 6 Helix. Um, but a couple other devices that are similar for this that you should be aware of, there's one called the Fractal Axe Effects. So we have a couple players at LCBC that use the Axe Effects. Um, there's one called the Kemper Profiler. The newest one that everybody's crazy about is the Quad Cortex from Neural DSP. And then this is uh, Line 6, and they have a number of products. So this is the Helix LT. There's also another variation of this called the Helix Floor, which looks very similar to this. It just has a few extra features. And then there's a smaller version of the Helix called the Helix Stomp. Um, and the Helix is Line 6 is more professional grade products. They also have a line of stuff that's a little more, um, uh, uh, it's not, that it couldn't be used in a professional setting, but it's a little more um, accessible price point wise. And that's the pod series of effects, which uses a lot of what is in the Helix is just simplified. Um, so at LCBC, we use the Line 6 Helix for our backline guitar rig solutions. So each of our campuses has a Helix to use um, for their team. And we use the Helix specifically because like I mentioned, there, there, are, you know, there are some options that are more like for amateur and home use. There's devices that are more pro grade. The Helix is probably the most user friendly device in the professional kind of sector. So it's something that, um, you know, we can get those professional level tones, but it doesn't require um, a ton of training to understand how it works. Cool, any questions about that? Sweet. So before we hop into how to get the tones we're looking for out of the Helix. I just want to review the kind of tones that we're looking for. So you'll see you have a handout. And this is what I used the last time we did it. We have the, what I call the electric guitar tone guide, which I put together. And we're not going to read everything in here, but I wanted to go over something, this idea that I called core tone. That would be something that can cover the essential tones that you need. So that'd be kind of a straightforward rig that, um, can accomplish a versatile range of sounds or like, you know, a setup that you could use for a whole set list. Um, or if you are, or as you continue to grow as a musician and you want to add more complicated things, it would be the foundation you would build on for that. So in our context, we would say the core tone is the sound of a great, a great amplifier sound with distortion, delay, and reverb, which is kind of the basics for a number of other genres. I would say like the modern worship tones are similar to a lot of guitar tones found in like pop rock, uh, what's considered contemporary country, 
and then like um, some other pop music. And so today though, we're gonna talk about how to get that kind of sound with the Helix. Um, yeah. So before we begin, I'm gonna give you an overview of a couple things you need to know about this, which is how to turn it on. So the power switch is here, which actually I'm gonna just, you can see that there, here we go. Can you read that, is that upside down? Yeah, it is, oh well. So the power switch is here on your left, so we turn that on. You'll see that it boots up. We've got our guitar in here. So this is where you'll connect your guitar cable. And then we've got outputs, XLRs, and quarter inch outputs here. Um, so this is gonna boot up now. Should take a couple seconds. And then you'll also see that in the folder there, you have this paper. This is called, I call this, this is my Helix cheat sheet. And um, you'll also see a PDF with this guy, which if none of you have, if you haven't used this, this is like super, super helpful for you. This is like, this comes in the box with your Helix and this explains what each of the buttons do. Um, just kind of a general overview, what each of the outputs do. So if you haven't looked at this or you, this isn't your go-to when you don't know what to use, you should check this out. And it's probably still in the box that your Helix came in if you have that. Um, so, on this Helix cheat sheet, I'm not gonna go super deep into it, but there's a list of global settings that I recommend that everybody uses. And so that's just making sure that like, the settings for how sensitive the input and how loud the outputs are, are just consistent so that as we share presets with each other, they translate well across our devices. Um, and then I also have some recommended models for amps and effects, which we'll go into later. So this is gonna be helpful as we keep going. So I'm gonna pull up a blank preset here and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about this in a moment, but this, and you'll see here, so on the TV I have pulled up, this is called HX Edit. So this is a program you can put on your, your laptop, which helps you to edit it. Everything you can do on the laptop with the software you can do on the device. But I thought for today it's gonna to be easier to see it in both spots just so you can get kind of a general idea. So the first thing you'll notice is on the Helix, and this is it chopped off, it chopped it off on the, hang on, can we get, I don't know why it did that here. There we go. That's better, now you can see the whole thing. You can see there's two rows here on the display. And each of those rows um, represents one of the processors in the Helix. So the Helix has two, uh, um, basically two processors that can either work together or they can work separately. So these lines represent each of the processors in the Helix. Um, and you'll notice that each line has a circle at the beginning and a circle at the end. And so those circles, and you can see here on the computer, uh, Here's the input circle and the output. And these circles represent where each processor is getting signal and where it's sending signal. So in our context, pretty much we always use these uh, two paths in series. So where it goes the whole way through path one and then into path two. So we can use the combi combined processing power for one sound. There's a couple instances where maybe you would use them separately for like parallel processing, but the majority of the tones we're looking for, you're gonna find there. So. When I go to set up a patch, or the very first thing I think you need to know about the patch is how to set those inputs and outputs. So here on the Helix, you actually have this controller to the right of the display. Um, for what it's worth, I'm probably not gonna deep dive into every control, so like if you're like, I don't know how any of these work, I'll try to keep you up to speed, but I'm not gonna dive into exactly how every control works on the Helix, because there's a lot of YouTube videos that explain that by Googling how does this work. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna show you though is how to set your input. So you'll go over here. So this is the most important control on the Helix. So this is a, it's a button, it's a knob, and it's a joystick. So it's a lot, but it's super helpful. So we're gonna go over here to the input. You can see right now it's set to multi. So what we're gonna do is to get to the list of inputs, we'll just press down on this knob and then we can scroll through it. We're gonna set it to guitar. So multi basically would say, hey, anything that's plugged in, I'm gonna take signal from any of the inputs. Generally, we're gonna have one thing plugged in at a time, but if the uh, occasion arises where you plug into the wrong port or have a special patch that's designed differently, we wanna make sure that our standard patches are just set for guitar only, so that when we make something special or do something different, it doesn't mess up what we're trying to accomplish in our more straightforward patches, if that makes sense. So we'll set this to guitar. So now that we've set that to guitar, we'll go back, which we can hit the home button here, and that'll take us back to our signal path. So then to link the two signal paths together, we're just gonna go to the end of this first one, 
Same thing, we'll click this for the list. And you can see that the first option it gives us is to path to A, um, which the looks like the computer's following along as we go. So we'll do that to 2A. Now if we go back to view, you can see here on, path, on this first path, and over here there's a little arrow that shows, hey, this is already automatically receiving signal from the first path that's sending it. And then go to the very last output. So we'll jump down here to the second line. The very last output is set to multi, which normally I would just set that to XLR or quarter inch, whatever I'm using. To me, just the most, the most you can simplify kind of your inputs and outputs, the easier it is to keep track of where things are going and uh, um, just help you troubleshoot if you run into problems. Any questions about signal path? Have you found a benefit to going direct out opposed to running through the app? Um, there's conspiracies about that. I recommend using the XLR outputs. I think that people have, there is some thought to it because if you're going out the quarter inches and then you're going into uh, DIs, that is a different impedance than if you're going directly out. And there are people that claim they can hear the difference. And I actually saw someone, uh, there was a pretty, there was a video I watched on YouTube where somebody, they weren't using the Helix, but they're using one of the competing products. And they actually could show that they could measure that there was a little bit of a difference. Whether that's enough to matter, I don't know. But the, the XLR outputs on the Helix have always worked great for me. So Cameron, with that, mm -hmm. do you use mic level or line level output? Um, I wrote it down here. I pretty much always use mic level output. Okay. Line level gets super loud. It's usually, so what I'll typically do is I'll set it on mic level and run it with the output the whole way up. So then that's just the easiest way to remember that I'm not like, oh, the Helix is super loud. I always do it at this volume or this, I just mic level, full volume on the master. That's the, kind of the easiest way for me to just remember. So once we've got our inputs and outputs set, I'll show you a little bit more here. Uh, we'll go back to that. So I accidentally erased my preset, which I'll show you how to save things here. So if you make edits like this, the easiest way to know you made an edit is that you will see this little E. It's hard to see it on the camera, but the little E will pop up by the name of your patch. And here on the, uh, on the app, it goes and italicizes the title of your patch if you make an edit, just so you know. So the easiest way to save it is to press the Save button. You can use the joystick here to change your title of your patch. Down here is your set list and destination. The set lists are just folders that you can save your patches into. And then the destination is which preset is it going to be. So you have like a number and then A, B, C, D, which correspond to these rows here. So to show you uh, another cool thing, on the Helix, every knob except for the master volume is also a button. So here where it says save, to save this preset, we're going to press down on the button on, on the button that's also a knob underneath it. Make sense? Cool. So, and I promise we'll get to some more interesting stuff in a second. But to get started here, we're going to, sh I'll show you um, to add a block. So a block is just an effect, an amp. It's a thing that the Helix can do. To add a block, a block to the signal path, you just select an area and you press down here. And you'll see we've got these categories, um, which here on the editor over here on the left, so favorites is just a folder you can add your favorite effects to, but we've got distortion, dynamics, so that's like um, effects like a gate or a compressor, EQ, modulation, delay, reverb, pitch and synth effects, filter, wah, and then these amp, cab, IR, which we'll go over that separately, volume, panning, send return, that's to like send your signal out to another device and bring it back in, so if you're using a pedal along with the Helix, which most of you probably won't, and then the built-in looper, which is fun to play with. But if you want to add a block to your chain, what you'll do is you'll scroll down here and you'll select, uh, you'll scroll down to the category you want, press down your joystick button here, and you'll select a category, so guitar, bass, and you see these ones called legacy. Basically, those just include uh, what they did when they made the Helix is they included all the effects they had from their older products as well. So it's just letting you know, hey, this one might have a few less features or functions if it's in the legacy category. So do guitar amp, and then here is all of the amps, which the fun part is these are all, most of these are based on real amps. They just can't use the real names, so they make up names. So pretty much anything in here that's called US is like a Fender amp. And then like um, any, like the A15, A30, those are all Vox amps and stuff. 
And usually if I don't know what it is, I'll Google it. Like, what is the Helix Brit whatever amp? And then that's how I find out. But sometimes it doesn't really matter what it's called. If it sounds good, that's what matters. Um, any questions about adding blocks or routing your signal? Cool. So um, when you're using the Helix, the number one area that people usually get tripped up, and what we're going to focus on now when we talk about dialing in is the amps. So as we, when I gave you kind of the overview of what I called the core tone, where it's amplifier and then you add distortion, delays, and reverbs, that's kind of the order of complexity, I would say, for adjusting things on the Helix, is that when you think about like those devices in the real world, an amplifier is a much more complicated device than like a pedal that has one knob or two knobs on it, right? And so because of that, uh, there's more complexity. What? Oh, this is, he's just programming. Oh, it's cool. There's more complexity in the Helix. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. There's more complexity in the Helix surrounding guitar amps, and that's the easiest place to get kind of tripped up. Um, and that's the easiest place for there to be variation that you don't want. And so I'm going to give you an overview quickly of how this works, and then we're going to play, and we'll get some sounds going here. So you'll notice that over here in the amp section, there are a couple categories. So there's amp plus cab, amp, preamp, cab, and then there's one here that's called IR, which we can see kind of here. You can see these. I'm going to hide this list of presets quickly. That's why it was filling up the screen. So quickly what these are. So when you have a guitar amp, there's, there's kind of like generally two components. We think of the amplifier and the cabinet. So the amplifier is the circuitry that makes the amp work, and then the cabinet is the speakers that the sound comes out of. So in a lot of contexts, you can buy a guitar amp where they're combined, or you can buy those components separately and mix and match um, the speaker with the amp, you know. Um, and so in the Helix, you can do the same thing. So in this amp and cab section, what this does is when you pick an amp, so say we go in here and we pick, ooh, we pick uh, like the AC15, right, which is this A15. This is going to automatically pair. In the real world, when you go buy this, guitar, this amp at Guitar Center, it matches the amp sound with the speaker that would come with it. Um, and so if you're cool with that, this is an easy way to do it. Um, personally, I like the flexibility, and I think they knew that people like the flexibility of mixing and matching stuff. And so that's why we have these options here. So you'll see there's the option to add just an amp and then add just the cabinet so you can mix and match your options. Um, in here, there's also one called preamp, which the idea for that would be like, hey, if you're using the Helix into an existing guitar amp, or maybe you're kind of mixing and matching the Helix with some other gear, you'd want even more flexibility with some of the amp stuff. I've never used one of the preamp blocks in here. Maybe I should start using them. I don't know. But I've never used one of those. I always either use just the amp and cab block where they're one block or where they're separate blocks. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to add an amp to our patch here. Um, just quickly to show you, let's pick one, let's see, ooh, we're going to add that. So you can already hear it hissing because I added that and it's amplifying nothing right now in true guitar amp fashion. Uh, what we're going to do also, um, we're going to add a volume pedal in so that we can turn that volume up and down. Let me go ahead and add volume pedal, which the cool part, of, if you drop a volume pedal into your Helix patch, it automatically assigns to your pedal here, so you can hear it's turning the volume up and down. Um, so I'm going to show you probably what the first mistake is that a lot of people make with amps in the Helix. Does anybody know what mistake I just made with my patch that's one block? I'll show you. Yeah. It sounds terrible, and that's because you're hearing the sound of what would be considered like a guitar amp without the speaker, which is something that can't really happen with physical amps in the real world because they need the speaker connected for everything to be balanced electronically. Um, but in the Helix, it can do that, and it sounds real bad, as you just witnessed. That didn't sound like a guitar tone we'd want to hear in our band. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and drop a cabinet in here. and We'll dive into this a little bit more, but uh, just quickly, single, dual, Single legacy, dual legacy are your options. Uh, single, dual. Do you want one speaker? Do you want two speakers for this amp? I pretty much always just use single. 
it uses a little less processing power on the Helix. Um, and you can see there's a ton of options in here. I didn't mark down exactly what I used, but we can talk about that in a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and use this cabinet because I know I like how that one sounds. And then you can see here now we've got two blocks. So here's our amp and here's our cabinet. And already it's gonna sound different. So I'll show you how that sounds. Oof. So this is without the cabinet. This is with the cabinet. You can hear how it's less harsh, right? And I'll show you a few more tricks for that too. Um, but I'm gonna keep my guitar on, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted. Um, and so, so when we're using a, an amp block, you wanna make sure it's paired with a cab block. And similarly, um, we wanna make sure that we're following kind of the same general principles we followed in the first session we did. So when I go to adjust an amp, I'm always looking to, uh, I'll do the drives first. So I'll, I'm actually gonna turn this down. So I'll turn it down. So you can see these uh, different parameters here are assigned to the switch directly under them. So if we're gonna turn the drive up and down, we'll just adjust this knob under it. And then each effect block typically has two pages of effects, which you can toggle with the page buttons here. So you can see that this amp has one set of controls and there's a whole nother set here, which is something not everybody knows. And maybe the problem you're trying to fix is on the second page of options. <laughs> so, so you can see I turned the drive down on the amp so it already got quieter. Typically when I'm dialing an amp, my goal is that the tone would be a little more, not super clean, but uh, not too overdriven as well. So if we crank this up, you'll notice that's probably more gain than I want without any pedals. So I'm gonna find, try to find a spot where it's not, like to me, if I play kind of hard, you can hear it start to distort a little bit. I might add just a touch more. So that feels pretty good to me. And I picked this amp because it's one that's easy to make sound good, which is on my list of amps. There are kind of the ones I've found are easier to adjust. Um, but here on the second page, these are more advanced. Usually the second page has more advanced settings. So I don't usually adjust those a ton. Uh, but sometimes you'll look on here and you'll see that one of those is like cranked up the whole way. For example, there's this one called Hum, which is supposed to emulate what an amp would sound like if it was very old and not taken care of well. So you should hear, you probably can't hear it through the speaker. That's just my guitar noise. But if you have like headphones on or something, when you turn that hum up the whole way, it'll actually like make this like terrible low frequency noise, which I love that they went to all the work of being able to do that. But that's how much work they put into trying to make this stuff realistic is that if you want your amp to sound like it's broken, you've got the option to do that. <laughs> um, so we're gonna go over here to the cabinet and the cabinet is where uh, the speaker is where I like to use the editor on the computer. Cause if you see on the TV here, you can actually see where the microphone is. And so we can start to actually, so we had talked about this with the real amps, but where you place the speaker and the, the microphone on the speaker really makes a huge difference on what it sounds like. So you can adjust the angle, you can adjust the distance side, or you can adjust the position side to side and the distance front to back. And so this just gives you a good visualization for how to do that. You can also swap out microphones here. So like if we want to do like a 414, we can move it side to side. And you can do the same thing you'll see here when I do the adjustment on the Helix, it does the same thing. And what I wanna show you in this, right, you can experiment with that and if you wanna know more about like, hey, where would you set a microphone for a speaker? We talked about that pretty in depth in the first training we did, so you can go back and look that up. Um, the one thing I do wanna point out to you is that your two best friends on the Helix with the speaker cab is the low cut and the high cut. Um, the reason for that is, you know, the Helix has the ability, because it's made to do so many different things, it has the ability to um, really recreate things at a much wider bandwidth than some analog gear. So like there are some guitar amps that like have certain speakers in and certain components that limit what frequencies can come through. So they might only send frequencies up to like 7K and then it starts to die out because that's just the components that are in it versus the Helix is full range. So sometimes um, with the Helix and other digital products, it does more than we need it to or it does more than what feels natural to us. And so the low cut and the high cut here are specifically helpful when you're trying to 
um, smooth out the tone a little bit. I don't know if you guys have ever had it where you like, there's something about the Helix that just feels a little harsh or the sound I always think of, it feels fizzy. Where you're like, I don't want my guitar amp to feel fizzy. I'm gonna try to show you what I mean by that. Um, let's do. And like I said, this, I picked an amp sound that I like, so it might actually <laughs> sound better than I want it to. But let's do, I'm gonna put a little more distortion on this amp here. See if we can. You hear on the high end, it's like shh. When we pull the high cut back, and these speakers that we're listening through aren't the most full range either, but it tames a little bit of it. And I know it's hard to hear, but when you roll the high cut back, that helps. The other thing is bringing the low cut up to a certain frequency. So typically I start with um, my low cut somewhere between 80 to 100 hertz to pull some of that subby stuff down. And this isn't like it takes everything out. It just is like a little bit of a curve. It smooths it a little bit. So I'll start with the low cut around 80 to 100 hertz here on the Helix, which just means any frequency below that, it's starting to um, pass, high pass a little bit. And then high cut, I'll do similarly, I'll do um, somewhere between, I'll ta start taming somewhere between five and 8K. Um, and to me, that gives a more natural resp response to the amps. Does that make sense? Any questions about uh, amps or cabinets or putting those pieces together? What this sounds like now, yeah. Well, if I turn the volume up. I'm gonna go and turn this back a little bit. To me, that feels more like a, gu a guitar amp than maybe if we had left some of those frequencies in. You'll probably be able to feel if I put some of this subby. If we roll it up too high, like if I roll the low cut way up, then it feels thin. So you want to watch out for that. Um, and you know, here on the stage, we're just running through these wedges that were, that were here. So they're not the most accurate full representation. For me, when I'm really getting serious about dialing in my tone, the best place to do it is in your auditoriums where you're playing back. So like when I was first, when I very, when I first bought my personal Helix that I've been using for a number of years now, I went and just set it up in the tech booth at my campus when I was at Harrisburg, plugged into the back of the console, flat EQ, and was just like, hey, what's the best sound I can make in this room? Um, and that's kind of the best way to do it because you can make something that sounds good on headphones, you can make something that sounds good on speakers, but most likely you're not leading worship to people wearing headphones or to people sitting at your desk. You're leading to people in your room. So to me, it's just like dial the sound in for the space you're gonna be in. Um, and you're gonna have to do some do less work there. Make sense? One last thing I'll show you with amps, and then I'm gonna pull up a full patch for us and we're gonna dial a tone in, um, is to show you there's something in here called IRs. So the IR is what's is short for impulse response. And the way I think about an impulse response in our context is, so here on the, like here you can see on the editor, we have a speaker with a microphone and we can move the microphone around, we can, yeah, we can pick what microphone we're using, we can move it around and get it just where we want it. And an IR would be like, hey, if we took a picture of that, like a snapshot of that sound, and just saved that snapshot just like we left it. So it, and then you could share it with other people as a third party file, if that makes sense. So what's cool about impulse responses is that there's a lot of people out there that have just different gear that's in the Helix or maybe they already did some work that we wish we could do, um, and they saved it and shared it with you, if that makes sense. So they, it's like a capture of like, hey, here's how I set it up. One of the things that's cool is there's actually a couple companies that I use impulse responses from. There's one called Tone Factor. Um, there's Tone Junkie, Worship Tutorials, a couple of those companies sell them. And what's cool about their captures is they'll capture not just the speaker and the microphone, but they'll capture like running it through like more expensive studio gear. So not only do you get access to like, hey, they own a, a great vintage speaker and a great vintage microphone, you also get the added like, and then they ran it through some of their vintage gear to capture it. Um, some people really like impulse responses. Some people think it's dumb. Um, I use them. One of the things I, one of the reasons I use them is it's, there's less options that way. And one of the things you might've noticed is there's so many options on the Helix and it's kind of like, hey, where do I get started? So for me, um, there've been times where in the past I'll like buy a patch or get like a free patch. I'm like, hey, this sounds like 80%, 90% of what I'm looking for. 
And if that has an impulse response in it, I'll save it because I'm like, hey, this is already 80 to 90% of what I'm looking for. Maybe this snapshot of the CQ or whatever is going to help me. Um, but they'll build it in, the built-in ones of the Helix are great just for fun. I have a patch here that has an impulse response that's based on the exact same speaker and microphone that's in the Helix. And so you can hear that. I don't think you'll hear a difference here, to be honest. So there's one. That one might be a little brighter, but it's the same. We could get them really close. So it's really more of just like a tool. It's a different tool for you to use as opposed to like something that might be drastically different, if that makes sense. So the Helix is everything in the box you need, but impulse responses are a tool you can use. Um, and like when I share patches, that's a lot of times what I'll do. I have the impulse response in there. You just drag it in, drop it, and it's like, hey, here's half the rig dialed in for you. So it can be kind of both helpful or unhelpful depending on your context. Any questions about that? Cool. Um, so one of the things I'll show you, and we talked a little bit about these blocks, but I want to show you how to assign foot switches really quickly because I just used it. Um, but foot switches are how we turn stuff on and off as we're working through a patch. And I think it's super helpful to know how to map them. So here's a full patch. This is like if we built it out so you can see there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, and actually before we map foot switches, I'll walk you through this patch just to show you everything that's in. This is one that I put up. This is one I made maybe a year ago. Um, so this patch, it starts with a compressor um, and then a pit, some pitch effects which once, those are more optional. Like I said, if you read through um, this guide I put together, we, and we talked about this in the last training, there's like, we have what we call like our core tone, right? Which is those basic amp, distortion, delay, reverb. And then if we want to add to it, we can with some extra effects in. But because the core tone is dialed in well, those extra effects just kind of pop right in with our tone. So in this case, the compressor, uh, this pitch effect, those are kind of what I would call extras. Here's two drive pedals our volume pedal, two delay pedals, amps that are set up in stereo, which we'll talk about editing that in a minute, a couple modulation effects, which those are like extras, and some reverbs here at the end of the patch. Um, and so when I go to edit a patch, like I mentioned with amps, we, I will edit the amps first. And we're actually gonna take, the, this patch is a patch I made with a guitar I don't own anymore. So I have two guitars here, and we're gonna try to make this patch sound better for these specific guitars. Um, but the, the one thing that's helpful to know is how to turn blocks on and off. So you can see we have some assigned to these foot switches. So a lot of times you've probably loaded up a patch and you're like, I know these foot switches. You can see here, uh, if you hit this view button on the Helix LT, it changes the view to show you which foot switch is assigned to which thing. Um, but it's helpful to know how to turn effects on and off without the foot switches. Because if you're going to dial in an amp and there's three or four things that are just kind of always on, it's helpful to isolate. Um, different things. So if you have a, a block selected and you want to turn it on and off and it's not assigned to a foot switch, you use the bypass button here. Similarly, if you have a block that sounds really good and you just want to change where it is in the order, this action button lets you pick it up and move it in your chain. It also has the option here to copy if you want to copy and paste. So you can copy and paste from one preset to another. You can clear it. Uh, we can hit this here and clear the whole patch back to zero if we want to. Um, I'm just going to reload that. <laughs> and so that's a helpful thing to know too, how to use the bypass and action buttons. Um, yes, Corinne? Can you move something if there's already something in the way? Or will yeah, so like, well, for example, this patch here is basically full. This is about all you can do with the Helix, which this is pretty much what I'm using on the weekend. So you can... Yeah, so like if we have these two turned on here, if I lift this up and move it, I can just trade places with what's already there. So it swaps them. It just will swap them, yeah. The one caveat to that is um, the processors and the Helix, the limiting factor is just how much they can do. So you can add as basically as many blocks as you want up until it'll be like, hey, I can't handle this anymore. So like here on this second path, because I have these two reverbs loaded, if I would go to load, let's just see what we can load. If I would go to load like an amp, which we're not gonna do, but like you can see some of these are grayed out because it's just like, hey, we can't, we can't make that happen because we're out of processing power in the Helix. So sometimes you run into 
to that. The other cool thing about the computer editor is you can copy and paste on the computer editor too. So if you're doing something real quick, you can just come on here and you can literally just copy it and then we could open another patch and paste it in, which is super, super fast. Um, so yeah, we bypass and move things with the action and bypass buttons. And then we can assign foot switches, which we do by uh, hovering over the effect with our selector. So we'll find, say this drive pedal here, right? We wanna assign it, we'll hover over it, and then we're just gonna take our finger and touch the pedal we wanna assign it to. Was that weird? Wasn't that fun? It's like, um, I know, I'm a goofball. So we'll find the effect. We, the, each of the um, foot switches in the helix has you can tell when you're, uh, whatever it's called, touch capacitance. Is that the term, I think? Capacitor. Yeah, flux capacitor. And you can tap it and that'll, it'll know you're touching that button. And so it'll say, hey, do you wanna assign this to the foot switch? That will only come up for a little bit of time. So it'll come up and ask you. And if we say, yes, we want to assign this to this foot switch, then we'll hit okay. And now this foot switch turns that effect on and off. The next thing, we're gonna do, so let's assign another foot switch. So we'll take this delay pedal and assign it over here. So now we've got two different ones. Here's what's fun. If you have this effect here and this effect here and you wanna swap them, if you touch both of them, you can just swap them that way. And that's true for any, that's true for any assignment. So uh, some of you might use, there's something called snapshots, which I'll mention briefly later. If you wanna swap where snapshots are in order, you can do the same thing. You just touch both of them and then it'll say, do you want to swap them? And you can say yes. So that's handy. The other thing you can do is you can assign more than one block to the same foot switch. So like uh, we have these two delays, we could assign both of them to this. So you can see here where it says assign, it's, a, it's set to merge, oops. So if we merge it, then what it's gonna do now, you can see when I turn one on, it turns the other off. So it's flip flopping them. Or if you want them both, and it'll just, it'll just, uh, do whatever you tell it to. So if you have both of these set to be on when you assign it, then when you hit it, both of them are off. So you can get creative with, with those kind of things. The other thing I'll show you is if you just do what I just did and you assign two things to one button and you're like, how do I put it back to just one thing? Uh, if we scroll over to the effect we want to be the only thing assigned to that button, even though there's two, uh, we'll tap this and then we'll assign it, but we'll see, see where it says replace. We'll switch that to replace and now it's just assigned to one again. Does that make sense? So this is where I was talking about the Helix being pretty user friendly. Like once you learn some of these tricks and you practice them a couple times, it's, it's pretty easy to, to put something together here on the unit. Any questions about the foot switches? Cool. Um, now let's do this. Let's take an amp, let's take a full patch and let's dial it in for this guitar. So this patch, I don't actually, unfortunately for me, I buy too many guitars. So I'm trying to remember what guitar I made this patch with, but this is similar to what I base all my guitar patches on. So probably what happens to you, and this is what has happened to me in the past, is you get a patch from somebody else or you got the Helix from here and I had already loaded some patches on it and you find one and you're like, oh, that sounds pretty good, but I wonder if I can make this better or like, Maybe you have a patch that sounds great on your guitar and then your volunteer comes in and you're like, oh my gosh, what is that, right? So I wanna take a little bit of time now and we're gonna walk through that step-by-step step of like, hey, I got this patch here, I've got this guitar. How do we make it work for my guitar? And then maybe, we have plenty of time, maybe we'll have somebody else come up and try it too if you want to, to dial in a sound. But what we'll do, would that be fun? You wanna come do it, Taylor? Here, come up here. Come on. Yeah, why not? It'll be fun. Oh yeah, you got this. It'll be fun. So, come here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, maybe you should be over on this side. So you can see we've got in this patch, right now there's a couple things that are turned on. So we can see our amps and our impulse responses. There's an EQ here, and there's also a compressor. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn off all the blocks that aren't the thing we're trying to isolate. So whenever we're having an issue with something, we try to isolate it down to the smallest thing we can adjust, right? So if we're gonna dial in the guitar amps, which is kind of the first step we talked about with what we called core tone. The amps are the first thing 
If we're gonna dial in amps, we wanna just hear the amps without anything else affecting them. So Taylor, you can go ahead and turn off the EQ and that compressor. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is you can see this patch has two amps in it. So the reason I do that is pretty much all of our spaces, we're playing a stereo mix. We're giving the front of house engineer a stereo guitar tone and using two guitar amps gives it just a little bit more texture, a little more width, um, and just helps fill the space. I think it, it's it, a little more tastefully, just gives a little more variation left or right. Um, and so you'll see this patch has two amps in it. So what we're gonna do actually is we're gonna just start by dialing in one and then we'll go to the other and then we'll listen to them together. So I'll drive this one. So here's a new block I haven't shown you. This is called the mixer. So when you're on a signal path, you have the option. I showed you how you can move blocks around. If you have a block on the chain and you move it down, uh, it'll make a second line. So let me go and show you quickly. Uh, we'll come in here. So if we have, this, we'll, just, we'll do this, right? We have this amp here. If we grab it and move it down, you can see it made a parallel path. So I'll show you that again. So, right, we hit action, which lifts up our block. Pulling down makes a second path for it. Does that make sense? So what we're gonna do, so then if we would put two amps here, um, you can see they're both here and both of them are getting signal. So then what it does, because there's two separate paths, we can decide what signal goes to which path. So here before the amps, this is called a split. So this is deciding how your stuff gets sent. And there's a couple of different settings. Typically, when you're running into st to two different amps, the point is that the amps are either side of the stereo mix, right? And typically, the stereo amps are where that signal goes from being mono to being stereo. So usually, the split, this uh, split um, mixer block that comes up from default will work because it's sending the mono signal mono to both. So both are getting the full signal that's coming before them. Does that make sense? And then after them, we have another mixer. And this is the one that's helpful to know about because what this is doing right now is there's two amps. So amp, we want one amp to be on one side, the mix, the left, and one amp to be on the right. And right now you can see level A and level B, which represent these two paths. So the top one is path A, the bottom one is path B. And you can see that right now they're both panned center. So what that's gonna do is if you had headphones on, you would hear both of those amps together like this. And so then if we pan them, uh, that would spread them out so you're hearing them in both ears. Which, funnily enough, we're just listening back in mono right here, so you're not gonna hear that difference. But it's helpful to know how that works. So with that understanding then, when we go to edit a patch, we wanna isolate the two amps and so we can do that with the mixer. So we've seen this before, this is what I just showed you. So Taylor, you can go ahead and you can, why don't you bring down the volume of amp B? So level B, if you just turn that the whole way down, you're doing great. Now we're just listening to the sound of the amp on path A. So that would be the amp on the top path. So if we pull that up, Taylor, Now we're just listening to this amp, and let's go ahead and adjust this. EQ-wise, it's feeling pretty good to me. I would probably bring the drive up a little bit for the amp. Bring that up a touch. That might be a little too much. And what I'm listening for is when I'm on my bridge pickup, it has just a little bit of uh, grit to it. So it doesn't feel like super clean, it's not like, like an we don't want it to sound like an acoustic guitar, but we also don't want it to feel like we can't get a clean guitar tone. And so typically on your guitar, the neck pickup is a little quieter in output than the bridge pickup. And that difference in the signal that it's sending to the amp is what we want to push the amp to overdrive. So right now, that's feeling pretty clean. And when we dig in on that bridge pickup, that's adding just a little bit of grit. And that's kind of the spot I like to live in. Um, one thing I'm feeling with this, can we go to the, I like the EQ on this actually, it doesn't feel too harsh or too dark to me on the bridge pickup.
don't we pull the bass back just a little bit on this bridge pickup? Cool. So if the EQ feels generally right, I might just roll with this, to be honest. This feels pretty good. Let's go look at the impulse response, though. So I didn't show you what one of these blocks looks like when it's loaded up. So when it's loaded up, it'll show you the impulse response that you're using. And honestly, some of the reason this is probably feeling good is because the low and high cut were already set in this preset. But if we're feeling good with that, let's pull up the other. <laughs> so if you pull up the mixer, yep. Right there. So now we can turn down level A. Yep. And I'll show you, wait, before you turn that up, another another tr trick here. So for like I mentioned, each of these is a knob and also a button. If you do something like this where you edit it, if you press this button down, it'll return to where you saved it. So these are saved with the level the whole way up. So if we press that, it'll just jump back up to where the patch was originally saved. So now we're listening to this amp, which feels real quiet, doesn't it? Oh, and that's because of how we have this stuff patched in. That's okay. So we're gonna center this. That's a better idea of what it's sounding like. You wanna pull that amp up, Taylor? Let me show you another trick. If you push the amp button, it takes you straight to the amp as well. So that will get you to where you need to go. So what I'm thinking with this amp is it feels like it could use a little bit more mid-range to me. Feeling a little like scooped, so why don't we add some mids? So that happened because you bumped this foot switch and it thinks you want to edit that I now. This. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do let's add a little bit of mid-range. Yeah, and actually let's go and let's try a different impulse response with this one. You can go through the list here with the IR selector. So we have a bunch saved in here. On the computer, though, we can pull up the list. Mm -hmm. If you go there, we can see all the IRs we have loaded into our preset. So you can see, like, what, numbers 4 through 11 all have, like, the same title because I think down at the end it's saying what the difference is. But these are all the same speaker with, a different, with different microphone options, or a lot of them are. So let's just see. Yeah, so these here are all... You can see the name is all the same because I think the difference is that it it would say like when I downloaded these what the difference between each of them is. But these are each uh, 1960s Marshall G12 Greenback 25 cab mic'd up with a 414. So a 414 is a microphone specific model. So each of these is like a variation of the same thing. Which if I page through them is pretty subtle. But I like that, do you hear the difference from that from the first one? What were we on originally? I think we were originally on this one. Which this says an SM7, so that was a different microphone for this impulse response. Oops, I did the same thing that Taylor did. So if you have a foot switch assigned and you touch it, it instantly takes you to those settings. Which is helpful sometimes, but also kind of annoying. And this view button will toggle you to your different pages. And so just to demonstrate, actually, I'm going to use, we'll keep an impulse response on that first amp since we were liking how that sounded. But let's go ahead and put our, one of the stock Helix cabs on here. So I'm going to use one of my favorites. So one of my go-tos is there's one in here called the Greenback 25. So that's like the speakers that were on like the classic Marshall guitar amps. So think like the sounds of like early rock and roll music. And it's just a really nice like mid-range forward kind of it I think all guitar players kind of like the sound of it because that's what we've been conditioned to believe because that's where it came from if that makes sense so we're guitar players like this sounds good because it's what we're kind of all used to hearing um, so we'll use this one you can hear that's a little thinner so why don't we try a different why don't we try a different microphone on that with that mic adjustment well let's just and sometimes I don't even really read what they're called. I just listen for what sounds the best. So just keep scrolling through that, Taylor, and let's see if we find one we like the sound of. I don't like that one. That one's a little too dark, I think. I didn't like this one. The second to last and the one before it, I think I like the most. 
Let's try the one after that that we were just on. Uh, sorry, the other way. Sorry. The second to last one I think I liked. I don't even know what that mic is, but it doesn't really matter because if it sounds good, that's what we're going to go with. Um, and so let's take a look on page two here. So page two doesn't have much on it for these. So we can mess around with the distance. So that's going to be uh, and the edge and the position. So we can see on the TV, you'll see the, the microphone moving in. And the way I think about it is the closer front to back the microphone. So if this is the speaker. The closer you put the mic to the speaker, the more low end it's going to pick up, the more the lower frequencies are going to come up. And the more you move it to the side, the more you're going to turn down some of the high frequencies. So in this sense, it's feeling a little thin even when I move some of these around. So I'm going to actually adjust the amp. I'm going to go back here to our amp. Turn this drive up just a little bit. Which already gives it a little bit more fullness. But to me, that feels a little maybe too distorted on this pickup setting. So I'm going to pull that back. Yeah. So that's feeling a little bit better. And then we're going to go down here to this cabinet again. And you might feel like, man, this whole thing's about amps, because it kind of is. Because once we get these amps sorted out, the rest of this is going to fall in place pretty quickly. So I'm going to actually move the microphone back towards the center of the amp just a little bit more. To me, that's feeling pretty good. It's feeling a little more, I, I like the sound of that a little bit more than what we had before. So I'm going to bring this low cut up again. Um, which is subtle, but it, it's a, you can hear it affecting kind of the bass frequencies a little bit. And I'm not noticing anything on the top end that feels too harsh, so I'm probably not going to do the high cut for this. So now that we have that loaded up, Taylor, let's go ahead and put the mixer back where it was. So we'll do um, pan mm -hmm. B the whole way to the right, and then we'll bring level A back up. Yep. So there's both of our amps together. Um, one thing I'll do, and I'll show you this, is here on this patch, I actually have an EQ block that I put after the amps. And what I'll do with that is sometimes if I get both amps adjusted individually, and I feel like they're balanced to one another, right? So I get this the amp on the left and the amp on the right, and I'm hearing them together, and I'm like, they feel cohesive. I'll put this EQ here so that if I'm in a setting like maybe we're doing uh, a rehearsal or a line check or something and the front of house engineer gives me some feedback um, where I notice something, I can make an EQ change that affects both amps to just um, adjust something. Now, if it's something really bad and just it's not working at all, um, then it's better to go back to the beginning and work it out. But for example, I had a tone that I thought sounded really good with my guitar just by itself. And then I was here in rehearsal last week and in my in-ears it just felt a little muddy and I was talking to um, the guy was mixing at rehearsal and I was like, Hey, does this feel like, is, are you noticing that it's this too? Like, are you noticing it feels, and he was like, yeah, I feel like in the low mids, there's just a little too much there. And then we talked a little bit more and I was like, Oh, okay. So I want to cut out some frequencies in like the 300 Hertz area by a couple DB. And that really helped the tone to fit in the mix a little bit better. And that was something that I could do with two adjustments as opposed to like, let me take this amp and turn this up and turn this down. Like, it's great to be able to do the nitty gritty to get your tone established, but the EQ there just helps me do that. So I think on this patch, you can see these aren't even doing anything. So right now, the only thing, yeah, the only thing this is doing is this high cut after the amps. So we'll keep that bypassed. We won't use that unless we notice something. Um, so now we'll do the drives. So we've got our amp sounding good. Does anybody have questions about that? I know I'm just kind of going through and it's a lot of information, so. If you do have questions. Thank you. I just can't remember. Mm -hmm. on, our, on your patches that you sent. So typically I do have the EQ there. I'm not sure if it's what it's set to. You know, you'd have to go through and check. Um, one thing that is, I'll, I will point out, is with effects like EQ and other stuff, you have a mono and a stereo option. And so when we do this, where we have the two amps, one on one side and one on the other side, um, we want to make sure that every block we put after that is a stereo block. Because if we put a mono block there, it'll undo 
what we did to put things in stereo. It'll just make everything mono. So that's just a helpful thing too. So once the amps are feeling good, then we're gonna move on to drives. So I typically use two drives, which lets you combine a couple different options. So I'll do uh, one drive that's like a low amount of gain, a second drive that's a medium amount of gain, and then I'll have both of them on for a higher gain, if that makes sense. Um, so in this patch, my guess is now that these amps feel good, that these drives will feel pretty good. Let's try this one. Uh, we'll go back to view one, so you can see drive one, drive two. You wanna hit drive one for me, Taylor? Drive one. So that's just a little bit more, and let's hear just drive two. So that's kind of like my medium overdrive sound, and then both of them together. To me, that's feeling pretty good. And that's because we took the time to get the amps right. We can tweak these a little bit, so why don't we pull up that first uh, drive. So this is just a boost pedal. So you can see it only has three settings, drive, boost, and bright. Um, why don't we try those? So turn on, if you want to turn bright on and off. So that's off. That's on, it's pretty subtle. And then we can pull the, uh, why don't you roll the drive back a little bit? Which I don't know if turning it on and off is gonna make much of a difference at this, like uh, just bypassing the effect. Like you can't even hear that difference. So there's also a fine line where sometimes there'll be a patch that has so many things in it that don't really do much. You gotta decide if it's worth it. Um, because especially if you buy one, like sometimes I've bought a patch or got a free patch where it's like the ultimate worship patch and then there's like 1700 things and then a million things mapped to different assignments. And to the one guy who made that patch, who had the one guitar that all those subtle differences mattered with, it makes a lot of sense, but it can be pretty confusing sometimes too, which is why for the most part, my Helix patches are pretty one-to-one -one, where it's like just how I would set up the amps physically in the real world even though there are a lot of creative options you can have. Um, I just, for our context, especially where we're bringing other players in and we're trying to coach people, um, keeping this kind of one-to-one -one with what we do in the real world is really helpful, I think. Um, so let's listen to that drive again. That's feeling pretty good. Uh, try turning the boost on. I don't, let's see if that makes it any louder. Yeah, that makes it a lot louder. So I don't think I would use that. Let's uh, switch that off just so we can get a reference. Back on. So I would turn it up a little bit more actually. Yep, so I'm liking that. So why don't we go to the second overdrive and I'll show you a little bit of this specific. So this is based on a pedal called the Timmy, which the nice, uh, Line six name that they gave it is uh, the South Park version of that same name. <laughs> um, the thing I like about this pedal specifically is you can see that it has bass cut and treble cut, which is unique to this. There's not a ton of distortion pedals that have that, but it's one of the reasons this is my favorite because what it lets you do is it gives you one more set of EQ going into and out of your amp. Um, there's some overdrives that kind of will only give you one sound. Um, which can be work good if you're trying to get one sound, but we're trying to make a patch that's pretty flexible. And so what I like about this is I can use this same distortion block with all of my guitars and just adjust the bass and treble cuts a little bit to kind of EQ them for this specific guitar. So one of the things I noticed right off the bat is when we turn this on, my tone got darker. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's hear the clean tone again. Now when you switch that on, it feels like it got a little bit muffled and that's because we have this treble cut turned up. So why don't we zero both of those out? Yeah, this is gonna be bright. <laughs> and so what I'll do then is let's take the treble cut. I'll keep playing and you just turn it up to where it feels good. I go just a little bit more. Yeah, to me. Uh, and I'll do the same thing with the bass cut. So if you bypass that effect again, so let's just get a reference with our amp. Because if the high end and the low end of the amps feels good, the way we're gonna kind of judge our overdrive sounds is against that clean tone. 
I feel like that's adding a lot of bass as well. So you can kind of feel it rumbling a little bit more. So let's bring that bass cut up. I might do it just a little bit more. That's feeling pretty good. Let's listen to that amp again. Uh, I would probably treble cut just a touch. Yeah. And then on this uh, distortion as well, there's this clipping uh, feature, which affects kind of the, the mid range, I think. I like it in the center position though. And to me, those levels, the gain feels pretty good. I might actually roll it back just a touch, Taylor. So now, yeah, let's clean. Option one. Oh, yeah, let's listen to that, yeah, let's listen to that first one. Yep, so that's our drive two, this is our drive one. And you can hear that's just a little cleaner sounding. And so this patch here, like I mentioned, is the one that I put on all of our helixes from the start. So if you go to your helix and there's one called like full worship patch or maybe it's worship patch 2023, it's probably called a couple different things. Um, this is that patch. And what I love about it is, I think once you get the drives dialed in, the delays and reverbs are pretty much already set for you. So, uh, yeah, let's turn that first reverb on, Taylor. First reverb. That's that guy there, yep. So we already have reverb. And in this patch specifically, the way I have it set up um, is we've got drive one, drive two. We've got two delays. This slot here I save for like modulation effects or maybe whatever extra effect you want to put in. And then we've got three reverb options. So. I'll show you quickly how I put together a tone and then we can do some questions. So we would maybe use drive one. Actually, let me illustrate these quickly. So here's the delay. So quarter note delay. That's based on the tap tempo. So if we go one, two, three, four, it's gonna go one, two, three, four. And then the dotted eighth delay, which is based, uh, basically what a dotted eighth is, is if you have an eighth note, it's an eighth note and a sixteenth note together would be a dotted eighth. And that's kind of the sound that a lot of modern guitar has. So if we tap that in, one, two, three, we'll go. So if I'm playing something consistent, it's kind of bouncing behind what I'm playing. It's like uh, people think of like the edge from U2. It's kind of the guy that made that sound thing. And a lot of worship music uses that too. So we've got those two and then we've got reverb. When I'm playing, I leave this main reverb on all the time. I don't really ever use, for worship songs, I don't really ever use a sound with no reverb on it. So that's just kind of there to glue everything together. Then I have this preset, which is the same reverb here. Well, you'll see what it's assigned. You see how it changed those settings? Oops, so we have this on. This changes the settings of that same sound. You can see these. Uh, oh, I, I broke it. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> so you'll see these settings here changing as I push that. So what it's doing is it's making the decay a little bit longer and bringing the mix level up. And if it's helpful, I can show you guys how to do that here in just a second to assign something like that. But you can hear there's a little bit more of the same thing we had. And that's about as long as I would use for like a lead guitar part. So if we're playing like... Like that's a lot of reverb, but it's not too much where it's gonna like cover up what we're playing. Um, and then this last one I would use for a guitar swell. So Taylor, I kept you up here to help me with this. Will you be my oh, yeah. volume sweller? Absolutely. Thank you. And that's more reverb than I would use when I'm playing. Cause if I like strum a chord now, it's gonna be too much, but for playing some of that texture stuff, that ambient swells to kind of fill out space, I would use all three of those reverbs together. Um, so that's kind of an overview of a patch. What would be most helpful for you guys? We have, I tried to keep enough time here at the end that we can talk through some stuff. So we can talk about like dialing in some more effects. We can talk about assigning stuff. Um, where are you guys at? Like what would be helpful for you or like what are you running into with your teams? Um, that would be helpful. So, if you have your Timmy on, 
mm-hmm. and your front of house guys, like we're getting so much like buzz and you, you've dialed it in to, mm-hmm. it's definitely the Timmy. Like what can you do other than a treble cut? Are you saying buzz like when you're playing or are you saying like when you're not playing your guitar is just noisy? Yeah, it's just noisy when the Timmy's on. Is it an amp thing? So that would be your guitar. Do you, do you have a telly, right? Or you have a guitar with single coil pickups? Uh, no. Interesting. But my guitarists do. So typically, so you can hear this guitar now. Like if I, you can just hear that buzz. And that's just the pickups on this guitar. Even if I hold my hands on the string. And that's from the lights and other things. Like, And it's funny, if I turn a certain direction, it gets better. And then, so what you can do is you can try to gate that out. What I do is when I'm playing, if I'm not playing, I just turn the volume back. That's the most simple solution. But you can actually put a gate at the beginning of your chain if you want to. Um, If you're not careful with gates, you can cut out stuff you don't want to cut out. But what I would do in this situation is turn all the gains onto your maximum distortion setting, right, with both drives on. So we're hearing that sound. And then and this input block, input gate is here. And then you're going to take this threshold. You're just going to slowly bring it up until you stop hearing them buzz. So right now it's just assuming that that buzzing sound, anything, anything uh, quieter than that buzz is, is just assuming is, is just closing that gate, right? And so then when we play, we hear it open. And then you can hear it shut after a while. Will it interfere with swelly sound? Um, I don't know, let's try it. So if we use a clean tone. It didn't seem to. It's it's about setting it really subtly. So what I always do when I'm setting a gate is I will, yeah, like you can hear that when I tapped it, it opened, right? Yeah. So I will set it so it's super soft where it's like doing as little as possible. The other thing that's helpful to know, um, if your guitar players have, and probably like, are you running into this issue where like in the loud moments of songs it's distracting or like, probably like in the quieter moments, right? Um, One thing is guitars with single coil pickups. If you're in a pickup position that uses two pickups at once, it should cancel that. So like right now, we're on the bridge. If I turn both of these on, and then if I turn the other one on, and that's because they wire pickups to do that because they know that they, there are some noiseless pickups, but if you wire them, it, it's boring, but they wire them so that it cancels out that phase. Yeah, Byron. And wouldn't the position of the gate in the signal path change yeah. what it's doing? Yeah, and so that's one of the things that's helpful about this is the very first thing. So we can add a gate somewhere else, but that's going to get sketchy. So it's just built into this input block here. I think that's why it works so well in this context, because it's able to get the most clean signal. I could show you what a gate would do after if we want to. So we could put a gate um, at the very end of the chain. And that's not going to turn out as well. So we can try. That would be in dynamics. There is one in here called hard gate. So right now, everything. There we go. So did you hear how hard I had to play for that to go? So if we turn it up even higher, like. I can't play hard enough for that gate to open. So that's some of the danger with a gate is you could get it. So even with, yeah, let's do a reverb swell, Taylor. So we're gonna do, you heard it? And then you'll probably hear it cut off at some point. Yeah, there. And so we don't want those kind of sounds. So that's some of the, that's some of the sound of somebody's like, I hear a gate opening and closing. They're talking about that. Any other questions about that or similar things? If you, so if you're using one of the patches that you give in campuses, mm-hmm. and so you have a guitar player who's using it, and it's sounding, for me, I have a player, it, it always sounds really thin. Mm-hmm. Do you suggest going then back to the amps to adjusting that? Yeah, so probably thin would come from there being less signal. Um, let me just switch my guitar and we can hear, because we f- I felt like this patch was sounding pretty good with this guitar. So let's just try this other one and see what the difference is. 
Typically the, the first step is always getting the gain of the amps where you want them because a lot of the thinness or fullness, that's kind of the, like the EQ is just modifying that first step, with it, which is the gain. So we can pull up, and I don't know what this patch is gonna sound like with this guitar. So, to me this sounds a little bit more boxy. Like I don't like this tone right now. Um, and so like the same, I would do the same thing though. I'd start with the amps, and actually we'll do a speed run here. We've got what, a couple more, five minutes left. So we're gonna just do a speed run of this. We'll just do one amp here. But like, the first thing I'm noticing that I'm gonna listen for is the differences in the gains. And we talked about that we want the neck pickup and the bridge pickup, the differences in those gains to kind of push the amp. And I'm feeling like it feels like there's a little bit of drive or something on this neck pickup. So I'm gonna pull this back. So this is kind of the opposite problem, probably of some of your players were feeling maybe. Instantly, there's a little bit more clarity there. And I would probably pull the bass back. So that's where I would start, right? And already like, that sounds like a better tone than what we had a second ago. Um, so typically with the amp problems, you start with gain, work your way through EQ. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, Taylor. Sure, yeah. So snapshots are kind of like a power user feature. I don't use them, I use them some, and I think they can be helpful. Snapshots are basically, so if you have a, a preset, right? Or sometimes we call them a patch, but a preset is like all these pedals you're seeing here, all this gear that's here in this window. Um, and a snapshot would be like, hey, can I save a couple different presets with this gear? So it's a preset inside of a preset. The way I use snapshots is basically just song to song. So I'll have one patch that is, this is the guitar rig that's dialed in for my guitar. And then from song to song, I'll change a snapshot, which will just change a couple things. Um, so typically, and I don't know if this, this is the helix I took out of the central office, so I don't know if this is configured the way mine is set, but typically I'll set the, if I think about having a pedal board, right? What would I change song to song? Probably I wouldn't change settings on the drive pedals right? Because I have the three options I'm going to use here. The main things I would change would be like, hey, what, what kind of delay sounds I'm going to use? Like how many repeats are on each delay or what's the BPM? And so that's what I use snapshots for. I just make one for each song. It'll change the BPM and then change maybe the levels of the delay pedals or the reverb pedals, which is what I would do on a pedal board, right? I'd have a delay pedal like with multiple presets and I could make one for each song. Um, so I showed you how to assign foot switches, but if you want to assign a parameter, right? So I showed you that each uh, of these knobs here is also a button, right? So if we want to change the reverb, right? We would just change it with the, so this is the decay of the reverb. We would change that with the knob underneath it. If you want to assign a parameter, you hold down the button that corresponds to the, well, now it's not going, is it? There we go. And so now what it's saying is, hey, here's decay is the parameter, and then it's asking what the controller is. So we can go through this, and you can see on the helix here, when I get to the foot switches, it's lighting up which one I'm trying to assign that effect to. Does that make sense? So if we want to control the decay of the foots of the reverb, go to foot switch three, and then minimum value and maximum value are here. So we would do something like that, and then we go back and view it. Now this button here is changing that effect. Do you see that? The other, and so what this might, what might be more important for you guys to know is if you have a patch that's really complicated and things start changing and you don't know why they're changing, if you see that little bracket over a parameter with like the, where the text is white and in brackets, that means that's assigned to a controller. Whether that is this foot switch or like you were saying, Taylor, with snapshots, Snapshots are one of the options in here. So you can set it the whole way to the end and it's saying, hey, when I change the snapshot, I want that parameter to change with that snapshot in the preset. Does that make sense? So the reason that's helpful though is if you see these, if, if you're confused and it's doing things you don't want it to do and you're like, for some reason, when I change this preset, the decay keeps changing on the reverb and I don't know why, I don't want it to change. To delete a mapping, you'll hold down that button 
and then you'll just go through the parameter list until you see one that's assigned. So like all these say none, right? But when we get to decay, it says snapshots and we go, oh, okay. Snapshots is somehow assigned to decay. I don't want that. You can just see what I just did there. You could go the whole way to none. Then when we go back, we'll see, hey, decay isn't assigned to anything anymore. So that can be helpful if you're trying to diagnose something like that. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Or whatever that foot switch is. Sure. Do you have to unassign it from what it was before? Because isn't that like your second drive? Right, yeah. So if we went back to, let me go back to a patch where everything is assigned, right? So this is the patch we are in. So you can see like drive two is there. So what we would do then, yeah, it would be the same as like, so let's just do that. Let's take, this is a tremolo. We didn't even look at this one, but say we want to adjust, set the mix of this to that foot switch. If we put it on foot switch two, right? It, if we go ahead and do that, it'll do both right now. See that? So right now it's doing both. So you would just need to unassign that pedal. So the easiest way to do that then would be, the computer's the easiest way because you can go over here to where it says assignments and you can just find this list here shows everything that's assigned. So we just assigned, what was it? The mix of the dynamic hall. And we can just put this on none and that would clear it. You can, uh, there is a way to clear it on here. I'm sorry, it's, I was blanking on it. You gotta get more into the settings. Controller assignments is in here. And then you can see everything that's assigned. But that's like a lot. And that's what I was saying. Like, that's why I was talking about keeping our presets as one-to-one -one as possible with the analog gear. Because, the, and that's what's cool about the Helix though, if there's something really specific you wanna do, you can do it. But for our context, I, we really don't do that a ton. So, I don't know if that was a helpful answer or not. But yeah. anyway, thank you guys for coming today. Hopefully, hopefully some of this was helpful. I know it's like harder to explain it in like the computer form in the, on the unit, but hopefully you guys each had a takeaway and there was something that was, was helpful for you.